Um, well, I don't know if we're going to say too much about uh, making film in Seattle, but we will certainly say quite a bit about watching film in Seattle. I, one of the uh, really fun things about working on the exhibit was being able to think about uh, an arc that went uh, in the, the story of, the, uh, of Seattle as a town for art house movies, for a place where you can see foreign films and uh, independent films, which they didn't used to call independent films. I guess they were just small American films uh, before they were indies. And um, that, I, I was thinking, you know, watching the progression of that, that did not start in 1980 or something. That has its roots in some interesting things that were going on uh, some decades before that in terms of people who cared about showing these films and felt there was an audience to be developed for them and the theaters that were involved in that, uh, some theaters that are still around and some, some that aren't. And I thought uh, that Richard Jameson would be an ideal person to uh, talk about this uh, because Richard has, uh, has uh, both a, a long uh, cinematic memory, definitely, but also a long civic memory, having been uh, in Seattle since the mid-1960s or so as a programmer, as a teacher, as an editor, as a film critic, uh, Richard was the first film critic of The Weekly, for instance, for uh, almost the first 10 years of its existence and taught film at the UW and, um, and uh, some things that uh, he'll tell you about because I think we'll, we'll start um, at, I, at a, mo a moment where it feels like Seattle was learning about maybe becoming an art house kind of town for, for movie watching. And it, was, it coincides with a, around the time that, Richard, that you showed up in Seattle, uh, which you can, you can say what year that was, but uh, you, you fell, I think you fell fairly quickly into whatever was happening then. But maybe you can, you can give us a sense of what, was, what the scene was when you showed up. Well, when I showed up was in the fall of uh, 1965. Uh, my official mission was to become a graduate student of the uh, University of Washington, something I began to do almost immediately, very badly, for which I blame the movies almost entirely, uh, because um, I, I was amazed at uh, the resources available here, what, uh, how many different places you could go to see uh, movies that promised to be uh, amazing, and sometimes I actually were. And I would, I would add to your uh, reference to, to all the theaters that there was also the matter of I came to the University of Washington. The University of Washington had a, a remarkable film series at that time, which loomed large in the lives of many people who were interested in film. It was run at that time by uh, R.C. Dale in the Romance Language Department. And the first quarter that I arrived here, I had my first experience of seeing the work of a filmmaker in order and, and cohesively, and that was the, the films of Federico Fellini in the fall of uh, 1965. Uh, fortunately, Fellini had made just enough films to uh, ideally fill a 10-week quarter. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think he planned it that way, but it worked out very well for us. Yeah. But, but there, there was that going on at the university. There were uh, a, a good half dozen theaters that you uh, had to keep your eye on and it would be surprising to know what some of them were at then. Um, the Guild 45th was a single screen theater. Everything was a single screen theater in those days. And um, you might see uh, an Italian or British film there, as you would at the Varsity on the Avenue. The Varsity a bit more reliably committed to that kind of fare, whereas the Guild 45th would 45th would also be showing some major Hollywood releases. Um, the Uptown in um, Queen Anne uh, was a place uh, you would keep your eye on for things like just that year of 1965, uh, The Pawnbroker uh, or um, R uh, Richard Lester's The Knack. Uh, it was a real destination theater for uh, people who were, who were following art cinema. But the, 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 the place that just towered over all of them that in, in importance was uh, the Ridgemont up on uh, Finney Ridge, um, corner of 78th and Greenwood. And uh, the Ridgemont was just amazing to this child of western Pennsylvania. 
who's, who's only access to to art films in in that corner of Ohio and Pennsylvania was uh, an occasional Inger, in, uh, one night showing of a an Ingmar Bergman movie at what was a, a otherwise a nudie film theater over in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, well, Youngstown. I mean, come on. Uh, or or, or, or uh, uh, usually a British film, sometimes a dubbed Italian film at the Squirrel Hill down in uh, down in Pittsburgh. But um, here there was all these films going on and. The Ridgemont um, changed almost every week. A two-week run at the Ridgemont was unusual. And uh, usually it was a double feature, and maybe both of them would be first-run films, uh, of uh, foreign films, occasionally what we now know as indies uh, or, or, or documentaries, um, but, uh, but mostly foreign movies. At the end of every academic quarter, there would be, I think they called them, they may have called them festivals, I don't remember that for sure, but the the first quarter I was there, there was a Humphrey Bogart festival for about 14 or 17 days that exactly coincided with finals uh, at at, at the University of Washington. (laughs) And uh, the the next quarter, uh, it was Kurosawa. I had never seen a Kurosawa movie and two and a half weeks later, I had seen 14 of them, uh, yeah. and and uh, that's just that's just the way it was. Um, this is it, this it was, is your way of saying that you did not complete your graduate degree, <laughs> is that right? I, I I had I had meant to let that slide, but as a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I never did complete my graduate degree. But I think I probably got a better education in a way uh, from from what I was going to see. We should, we should, so we should mention the name of, of the fellow who uh, was sort of running the Ridgemont, uh, which will lead us to talk about his, his second theater, the Edgemont. Too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I meant to bone up on this before coming and, and getting straight on facts. A lot had happened before I came to town. Uh, this fellow's uh, name was, uh, and still is, uh, Jim Selvage, James N. Selvage, and I I think he hailed from Shelton originally, and it somehow got into the the business of running an art theater, as they tended to call them uh, in in those days. And um, I think it was during the 1950s that he began fighting a fight against the Seattle Censor Board and the very fact that your eyebrows may go up and you say there was a Seattle Censor Board. Uh, can can be traced back to Jim because he put him out of business. Uh, he and his his lawyer Bill Dwyer uh, uh, fought for uh, uh, the, the freedom of exhibition of uh, well filthy movies like Ingmar Bergman films, and uh, it was a very embattled time politically. Uh, Selvage and the Ridgemont were often targeted, fortunately only editorially, by the Yakima Eagle, uh, I remember, and uh, it was it was a um, uh, a cell of the American Civil Liberties Union, and in fact, you had only to walk up to the mark uh, to the box office, lean down, and whisper A C L U, and you could get in for nothing. Uh, uh, we we didn't know that the staff. I don't know how many people we turned away who were muttering ACLU, but but that was the kind of image yeah. that Jim had. He, he in his he wrote a memoir, uh, which is sort of self published, I suppose. It uh, is self published, but it, but it tells an interesting story about that time. And yeah, he he talked about showing some documentaries that were too progressive for some people, and that got that might have got him. In Point of order it. about the Army yeah. McCarthy hearings was uh, yeah. particularly annoying to the right wing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he had worked, maybe he had worked at SRO before he got to the point of um, taking over the Ridgemont or something like that, if, could, if that's what I'm remembering from his book. But, uh, uh, well, but so he, uh, he hired you at some point. Well, again, 1965 uh, happened to be the year that he was starting another theater, um, and it kind of rhymed uh, with the with the main theater, and this was the Edgemont 
which was out in Edmonds. I think it had been the Prince's Theater, where, where well, it sat there innocently for a few decades, just being a neighborhood movie house. But Jim and a Seattle booker named Bud Saffel uh, decided to uh, take a five-year lease on the place. And uh, Jim thought he could run it sort of as... Uh, sort of like an English language arm or, or, or counterpart of the Ridgemont. And that if people didn't want to go to movies and have to read the words, uh, they could see dubbed as opposed to subtitled versions of some foreign films. And you often had the chance of book, uh, the choice of booking either one of those uh, versions. They could go see the dub version out at the Edgemont and they could also see they could trust Jim to determine what were the most uh, important and aesthetically rewarding English language films, films like The Knack or The Pawnbroker or The Collector, and um, and and show them. And 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 so he'd have uh, he'd have two audiences. And I never talked about this with him, but I it was always my theory that he was kind of screwed by his own success in developing a a savvy local audience because uh, they didn't go to the Edgemont because they didn't want to see dub versions of foreign films. They mm. had learned to value the experience of hearing the foreign language performance in their ear, even if they mm. didn't necessarily understand the language and had to read the words. Um, and as for catching a second run of something like The Collector, well, they were already paying enough attention that they realized they should go see the collector and they had done so at, mm -hmm. at the at the uptown so the the edgemont ended up just just being an empty shell as far as uh, our commercial life was concerned and uh, and here was jim stuck with a five year lease that was going to play out until uh, 1970 and uh uh something else happened around this same time which was that uh a disaster hit the Ridgemont, and this disaster took the form of success. I said that uh, a two-week run was unusual at the Ridgemont. It was a fast turnover of foreign films, and there were people who every week wanted to go to the Ridgemont and see whatever the new movie was. In the fall of 1966, uh, Jim decided that it would be a good idea if he booked this French movie that looked like it was going to be a crossover hit and appeal to general audiences as well as uh, the foreign film crowd. And he would take the radical step of guaranteeing a four-week run for it. And so I think it was in November of 1966 the Ridgemont Theater began showing Claude Lelouch's A Man and a Woman. Mm -hmm. And they showed it and showed it uh, because <laughs> there was a holdover deal. If you did X amount of business on the weekend, you were obliged to keep the film another week. And even though after a while the, we were sitting there pretty much with an empty theater during the week, on the weekends it was a date movie and people would, mm -hmm. enough would turn out and we would have it again. And there were people who sat there, regular customers sat there for months seeing the, pre, uh, the previews again and again of <laughs> Marat Saad. Uh, <laughs> talk about torture. Uh, and and when, is it, when is it going to get here? And, um, and finally the frustration was building and Jim decided, I know, will in effect shift the Ridgemont to the Edgemont. It can't do worse than the Edgemont was then doing as a, uh, as a pointless uh, neighborhood theater. And so in the uh, fall of 1967, we started off with uh, Luis Buñuel's The Diary of a Chambermaid and a French comedy called, uh, well, the American title was Thank Heaven for Small Favors. I think Buñuel would have appreciated that pairing. Um, the, um, uh, we start, started running the Edge Montana, and I say we because I, I had been working for a while as a relief manager 
at the Ridgemont, and uh, he uh, offered me the chance to be the manager full time out at uh, out at the Edgemont. And so it became like the Ridgemont, and a week of Buñuel might be followed by a week of Godard. Mm -hmm. I remember we had the first run double bill of masculine, feminine, and band of outsiders mm -hmm. uh, in October, I think, of uh, uh, 1967. That's still some kind of existential <laughs> milestone in in uh, in my memory, uh, and. Uh, it was very lively programming, uh, and it became the only theater in the whole greater Seattle area that was consistently dedicated to showing foreign film and, and classic films because we got into a, a, a quarterly thing of doing, uh, well, it started out with the Janus Festival, and it would be classic films uh, being shown for three days and two days and two days, three different films uh, each week. It might be all Bergman this week. It might be all Truffaut the next week. Mm -hmm. And so we became a real rapid turnaround uh, uh, foreign film house. Problem was it was in Edmonds, and the people who used to complain that it was so far to go up to Finney Ridge to go to the Ridgemont from the university district uh, we're now complaining, God, can't you show these at the Ridgemont? Because mm -hmm. uh, to come all the way out here, it was actually a pleasant drive. But um, but but we, we, for two or three years, were the only place that was always showing that kind of film mm -hmm. in Seattle. And what was, the, what was the actual total run of A Man and a Woman? Fourteen uh, months. Mm -hmm. it, it, yes. it sat there, <laughs> and we got rid of it. Uh, we, uh, we finally got rid of it by cheating. Uh, J Jim said uh, one day, he said, "All right, you're going to uh, close the box office. You're going to close the books. You're going to uh, the box office form on Saturday night after the first show, and 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 put." put all of the, the rest of the night's take, roll it over onto the next night. So it would be the, the, the biggest Monday night in Ridgemont history. Uh, mm -hmm. But technically, we had not then met the holdover figure for mm -hmm. the weekend. We could finally bid, a, <laughs> bid goodbye to the thing. And people could see Marat Saad and be happy. <laughs> yes. Um, there are a few uh, theaters that... Uh, sort of came along in the wake of that, and we can sort of ping pong around to whatever we want, but the one that was big when I was just starting to be of an age when I got uh, really like movies, started to get, I, I liked watching Humphrey Bogart movies and such on Channel 13, um, and became aware that some theaters were showing them. Maybe I was kind of getting intrigued by seeing a foreign film or two and finding out what that was mm. all about, people are talking about. And uh, the theater that I associate with that um, was the Harvard exit in the 1970s because yeah. I, I don't know what the first movie I would have seen there that would have made me feel real grown up because it was French and uh, there might have been a couple of saucy scenes, you know. Uh, well, there would have been. It was French. Uh, uh, what it would have been, but um, that, I, I, I never knew too well at the time what the story was uh, behind the guys who, who made it that. Um, did you know about that at the time? Um, yeah, um, it was um, two guys who had no connection with the film business. One was a, an architect, Jim Osteen, and the other was a, a Boeing engineer, Art Bernstein. Osteen, by the way, has uh, no apostrophe. I think it's a Scandinavian name. Uh, but Jim knew about this wonderful building. I think it's a Women's Century Club uh, mm -hmm. up on up on Capitol Hill, and he thought it could be converted into a movie theater. And um, I don't know exactly how he and Art got to be friends uh, and or partners, but they're the ones who made it happen. And it started up 
It was going by 1969. Mm -hmm. I meant to look this up before coming and see exactly when they started, but uh, I know that one of their first big hits was the prime of Miss Jean Brody, and Maggie Smith got the 1969 Oscar for that. So that that gives us some idea. Mm -hmm. And not too long after they got going was when Randy Finley decided it would be kind of keen to run a bookstore in the university district with a movie theater attached and he could sell the book and show the movie that was made from the book, which was the original inspiration behind what was then known as The Movie House, Uh, a uh, 92-seat, 95 if they brought three stools in at the back, uh, theater uh, in a storefront in a, a former, university. A former dentist's office or something like that? Probably. I, I, I yeah. don't remember the dentist, I, but I wouldn't doubt it. I, I think that might have been a detail there. Yeah. yeah. And this is what we now know as the Grand Illusion. Um, Anyhow, that, that started around the same time, 69, 70. Yeah. I, can, I, I remember going to the movie house and seeing a... Um, it was kind of, it must have been 71 or 72, but there was a... Uh, the bit, I think the poster must have attracted my attention because it was something like, here's 10 weeks of cowboy classics or something like that. And it was, you know, a whole variety of, of old westerns uh, shown in repertory in the way that they did back then. Uh, culminating in the Wild Bunch, which I was, my brother took me to and which I was really too young to see uh, at the age of 12. <laughs> Uh, that was that was a trip. I was not quite the same uh, after seeing that movie at that age. But there was, you know, I think there there is something about the the funkiness of that place, and then you know these these uh, youthful associations of the Harvard exit with uh, going into that that strange lobby that doesn't doesn't feel like a movie theater. It feels mm-hmm. like something else. But it, maybe you were going to see a special kind of movie because. This is what an art house looks like somehow. Uh, yeah. Well, there's also the presentation. Uh, both operations, especially the Harvard Exit, were very personal presentations. Art and Jim made a big thing of we decided we wanted to show this movie. We wanted to bring it to you. And here's why we love this movie. And they would talk about it beforehand. And... Uh, and uh, Art would probably be out in the lobby talking with the people all through the movie, as far as that's concerned. Uh, but but it was uh, people liked the feel of that, mm-hmm. and uh, it uh, wasn't exactly uh, deep dish film criticism they were offering, but uh, it was personal involvement, mm-hmm. and uh, people really responded to that. Yeah, and they had the uh, free tea in the lobby. Does anyone remember this? The, the, the market spice tea or something like that? I, I was just so striking as a, this is something other than going to um, uh, the North Gate. Nothing against the North Gate, but I uh, saw a lot of movies there, but it, it had such a different feel. It was almost, uh, almost exotic. Uh, um, well, it was, a, it was, okay, it was a time of, of a bunch of these things coalescing, and we should also mention uh, something that, that uh, you were involved with at the beginning, and I, I joined in uh, many a few years later, which was the Seattle Film Society, um, nonprofit organization that uh, um, I don't think it's much remembered now, but should should be remembered, I think, for uh, the things that it gave to the to the Seattle scene. And Selvage yeah. was involved in in uh, Selvage started it. Yeah, uh, when he could see around uh, late sixty nine seventy. That uh, that you know basically he was going to lose his theater. That that an era was passing. That the audience for foreign film, uh, indeed across the country, was was shrinking, and the number of films that were being brought into the country was shrinking considerably, and it was mm. getting down to a, either something that had a sexy X rating or had the name. Bergman or Fellini attached to it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, probably wasn't going to get picked up for distribution anymore. Mm-hmm. And the Ridgemont wasn't doing business. I, this is sort of the other shoe dropping when I said the disaster hit the Ridgemont. It wasn't just that the Ridgemont was out of useful service uh, for all the months that a man and a woman was playing there, but, but, but its its rhythm was broken. 
uh, and and the faith with the audience was yeah. broken. That right. hadn't been the intention, but that was the effect. Mm. And uh, and and as as he moved toward the exit, as it were, Jim took it upon himself to invest some money. Uh, just and really, that was a matter of throw the money away. Uh, setting up this this nonprofit society that could maybe keep alive the spirit that had informed his theater uh, in its uh, in its best years, and in the years they had the the Seattle Film Society would well I would I would say in any given year two or three of the most significant local premieres of uh, of foreign films took place through the Seattle Film Society. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it was a matter of one showing, one night in an auditorium at the University of Washington or at the Seattle Concert Theater mm-hmm. uh, uh, or, or uh, on, on folding chairs at uh, in Bloedel Auditorium uh, uh, behind St. Right. Mark's, uh, various places that the Film Society had for for showing movies, um, and and we did put out uh, a newsletter that grew into a film journal that grew into a magazine of uh, of some consequence and renown, uh, Movie Town News, mm-hmm. uh, which came out from 1971 until 1981. Um, did the uh, did the Film Society fit in with uh, these other things that were going on because the being a nonprofit, it seemed. I'm. This is totally uh, my imagination, maybe, but it was a little bit outside of that other world of um, people who would go to the Jewel Box Theater to preview, which is now the Rendezvous Restaurant and down in Belltown. Used to be this uh, preview theater where mm-hmm. people would go and check out. And it's. A, it's. I guess it had a slightly different vibe from that now vanished world. Well, yeah, I, I, the Jewel Box was largely, uh, I mean, it was mostly a professional uh, trade screening room. Yeah, I, I just mean the world that um, um, was involved in that sort of commercial theater, even if it was an art house theater. Um, um, in the days of the Film Society, we didn't have anything like that. You got a, you know, you've got the catalog from one of those 16 millimeter companies uh, and looked up the movies and, mm-hmm. and decided to program them or something like that. Um, it just had a slightly different feel to it uh, from the, uh, by comparison with the, the the other art house movies, movie theaters that we're talking about. Um, w- w- were there some other, I, I mean, did you find that the audience that might have been built up during the 60s joined along with the Seattle Film Society when it came along? Well, some of them did. I remember at the beginning there were a lot of people who joined the Film Society under the impression that they were going to get discount tickets to the Harvard Exit, Mm. for instance, which was something they just sort of made up because that sounded like a neat idea. And Mm. it was. Just Art and Jim weren't going to do that, Uh, although they did do us uh, some favors. I wonder what it was. Yeah. I'm sure it was brilliant. Are we... we Back on. Okay. Well. Then, uh, well. Uh, what were we so that's about? how that Did happened, and yes. uh, we got rid of the body, and uh, <laughs> nobody ever knew. There were no charges filed. It was. It's amazing. Uh, but that's just between us. Um, uh, what were we talking about? By golly. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. Um, the oh yes, the carryover. Carry yes, yes, the, the, yes, the, the yes. free. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'll just mention another reason why the, the foreign film business kind of died out at that point, and this is sounding, uh, uh, this may sound fairly crass, but in, on the other hand, I, I just read so, no less august an authority than David Thompson writing about Parade's End and going on and on an appreciation of Rebecca Hall's breasts, uh, and I don't disagree with the man at all. Uh, but one reason people, you even hinted at this a while back, uh, one reason some people would go to foreign films is that they thought they were, they were going to get to see a little something they yes. weren't used to, whether it was outspoken political content, 
uh, or whether it was nudity or an attitude towards sexuality and infidelity. La dolce vita of some sort, yes. Absolutely. Uh, yes. And, uh, and, 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 and right around 68, 69, that, that was a period of the new permissiveness coming to, to Hollywood and the, the uh, uh, instigation of the rating system, which would say, okay, you're, if you're going to have that naughty stuff in the movie, you're going to get an R. And I said, well, we will take it because that will let us have the naughty stuff in the movie. And I think that a lot of people stopped going to foreign films because they could go to see a regular American mm-hmm. movie and get some of that kind mm-hmm. of titillation mm-hmm. uh, that, that previously had been exclusively the, the province of the, mm-hmm. of the art house. Mm-hmm. Now, that may sound like a, um, something in, in bad taste to say, but I think it was true. I think it, was, yeah, I think it played a role in uh, uh, eroding the support. Mm-hmm. For, uh, and they didn't have to read the words anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose that one of the other uh, um, there's another arc that we that we should at least mention, which is you you mentioned Randy Finley opening the the movie house, and um, some of you may remember uh, that name uh, because he t- then went from that one tiny theater to create what would uh, pass for an art house empire, I suppose, um, never having a gigantic theater maybe, but but some well some pretty darn big ones actually and stitching together the seven gables which became the flagship or at least the name of his his group um and the harvard exit eventually and uh, guild 45th and i don't know how many they were at the at the height of of uh seven gables theaters which is now landmark uh, but but landmark having shed off uh, some of those uh, movies i said shed I should probably have enunciated that. I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, which was a real, I mean, that was, a, that was certainly a significant moment uh, for the, 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 the uh, spread of the idea of the art house in Seattle. Suddenly there were a bunch of theaters, and uh, Randy Finley was, was uh, somebody who was out there hustling, kind of, kind of making that happen. And then at some point he he just left. I don't. Uh, he's he's still around, but he's he, he's interested in other things, I guess. And yeah, he, he he made a lot of money, and uh, I think one of the last things he did was to win a lawsuit against uh, uh, one of the local circuits and uh, some of the distributors, uh, Hollywood distributors, that he maintained that. Uh, he had made competitive bids to get certain films to show in his theaters, and, and he had been denied, even though he was certain that he had mm-hmm. given the best bid. And and it is true that uh, I, I know during the years that I worked in the theater, we were acutely aware that certain film companies were just like that with Sterling Recreation Organization. The uh, United Artists, for instance, was just... SRO had first first pick with mm-hmm. them always, and so if they had the new Francois Truffaut movie, I, I'm thinking of The Bride Wore Black, for instance, the minute we heard The Bride Wore Black existed and it was available in the United States, we knew we wanted to show it at the Edgemont Theater, but we didn't have a prayer until the booker for that region uh, spent a half a year or so lulling himself to sleep at night with dreams that the Bride Wore Black was going to open on the screen of the Cinerama. And of course, it never happened, never was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And eventually they'd say, <clears throat> You guys still want Bride Wore Black? Okay, you can play it uh, in July. And by that time, uh, the publicity, uh, people's awareness and excitement over the fact that The Bride Wore Black, a neutrophil movie, had come into the world, had sort of died a little mm-hmm. bit. Mm-hmm. And so probably not that many people remember that it would be a worthwhile idea to come out and see it. But uh, that that happened again and again. So I, I, I'm sure Randy uh, uh, was basically right in his lawsuit that he did win. And having won it, just basically said, what the hell with that? And mm-hmm. I think went off to learn about to become Francis Ford Coppola and making wine, making wine and, and things, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there was there was one other. Um, I mean, one one of the things that helped usher out the Seattle Film Society in in the mid nineteen eighties, for instance, and other kinds of repertory houses 
um, including long, those long, some of those long-standing series at the University of Washington, mm-hmm. which used to sell out the 700-seat Kane Theater um, in the afternoon and the evening every week, you know, for a 10-week quarter, uh, was was the rise of home video in the mid '80s, and uh, at, at a certain point, it was it seemed like it just sort of something had shifted and. You were not going to get people out for 16 millimeter uh, screenings anymore, and um, that became increasingly unlikely when home video got better and better as it went along. So that was, uh, I, I kind of associate that with the end of that particular definitely, era. Definitely, definitely. There was, uh, I just throw in one, one, one more before we just open it up here, but I, I was thinking earlier that uh, a little bit of a, uh, Going against that trend was the market theater. Well, began began its life as the Pike Place Cinema, uh, and do you know? Do you remember what year that was? Oh, I bet I can remember because you were teaching a class and at the UW when that opened. Oh, 1979. 79. Okay, and they, they, it was that for three or four years, and then the market theater did a little redo and uh, had it had a kind of a makeover that was a very fun. And they managed to make a go of it kind of by uh, programming a certain sort of movie uh, and framing it so that you got to go down to the market, I guess, and that was different and had a oh. certain feeling and atmosphere, and the theater was really funky and kind of campy and fun. Stop Making Sense was one of their first big ones. Yeah, yeah had, and uh, um, Jarmusch's uh, Stranger Than Paradise. Those two were like their first bookings and they both played a long time and they were just exactly that that hit the character of that theater uh but even but that even they couldn't there weren't enough movies that would fit that niche somehow uh it was it was too bad uh, because that was that was sort of drying up a little bit and uh i guess getting people to go down to the market became kind of dicey around that time too probably late 80s yeah um so would anyone like to join this and um Throw something into the mix, either following up something we said or the, something that we haven't haven't spoken of yet. Please don't be shy. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The question is about the Seattle International Film Festival and uh, where it fits into that that chronology of of, uh, the art house cinema? Well, it started in 1976, and uh, uh, I I would say that for the first uh, five or six years of its existence, it certainly contributed a lot of excitement, uh, made it uh, possible to to do the premieres of a lot of important films. I accidentally came upon the schedule of the first the first one last year, just about the time I was seeing the schedule for the current Seattle fil- uh, Film Festival, and and feeling fairly glum about the whole thing, and realizing, oh my God, yes, what was that like? Because it was it was Buñuel and it was Fassbender and. Uh, it was, uh, all these exciting new German directors, and uh, it was about it was about eighteen or twenty movies, and there weren't eighteen or twenty movies that auspicious in the entire three hundred or whatever that had been announced for the for the current festival. Uh, yeah, it, it used to be uh, a real a real trip, uh, just one night after another of. Not necessarily seeing a good or even a great movie, but really being excited about the possibilities. And uh, for that matter, uh, uh, Daryl McDonald and Dan Ireland also ran a theater the rest of the year, too. Uh, first the more, more Egyptian, as they dubbed it, and then the Egyptian up on, on Capitol Hill. So they, they were joining the fray of uh, art house things, and they were programming... Um, the kinds of things I guess you'd you'd expect at a at a, at a at a good art house theater, as well. So they they weren't just the story of the film festival, though that seemed to take over after a certain point, definitely. And you were going to ask something too. Uh, I was interested in, in how influential you think Nephilim and Egyptians have been over the last couple of decades for art house in Seattle. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who are interested. Question is about the Neptune and the Egyptian in, in particular. Those those two. Yeah, those two. Um, 
both of, both of which were folded into Seven Gables slash Landmark at some, at some point in their histories. Well, I was out of town for the 90s, uh, and I never had much sense of the, the Neptune as a consistently, as a, as a destination theater, was it? Um, I don't know. Do you have a sense of it as a destination theater? When I was a kid, it was showing Dick Van Dyke comedies, so it wasn't that yet, but... Uh, Yeah, I remember the 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 man who wasn't there. I think uh, played at the Neptune. Yeah. Well, when I was in college in the late seventies, it was definitely uh, a place where you could see Eraserhead. Um, um, uh, they showed a couple of Herzog movies and things like that. So yeah, I think they were they had that going. And then at some point, they also became the repertory house. Uh, mm -hmm. It had been up at the Harvard exit for a while where you'd see some, a new double bill every day. It would, might be Casablanca and the Maltese Falcon, and the next day it would be a couple of Truffaut movies or something and uh, occupied that niche for a while, which was, which was kind of nice. Uh, um, I, I, I mean, the Egyptian was a big theater that showed, uh, you know, the latest, I don't know, the tin drum and movies like that, movies that would be maybe in the running for Best Foreign Language Film Oscar, you know, that year or, or whatever, or really whatever took Dan and Daryl's fancy for a while there when they were, when they were running it anyway. I, oh, okay. Uh, you've been talking a lot about the art houses. What about the bigger houses, say, in downtown Seattle? What would have been the height of um, shows, whether it was at the Orpheum or the Palomar or, or the Coliseum? What era would that have been? 60s. Oh, what year would it have been? Yeah, around what year? Well, the, they knocked down the Orpheum in 66 or 67 or so, and the, the, some of the other big ones fell shortly after that. I mean, in some ways, I suppose the peak would have been well before that because uh, those, those big theaters were already struggling, I think, by the early 1960s because they occupied so much space and they just had one screen course, uh, so it was, was kind of hard to make it work unless you caught uh, the tail end. You, you caught something that was going to play for uh, quite a while. Um, gee, I don't know. Maybe the peak, I mean, the peak year for movie going was like 1945 or 46, uh, and it went through the floor after that because the television came in and, and a few, uh, and uh, the studios lost their, uh, uh, not monopolies, but uh, uh, pretty darn close because of some lawsuits. So that, that might have been the peak year for those big downtown theaters, I suppose. The Orpheum was still there when I arrived, and I have some very happy memories of the films that I saw there the first year or two. And then, as you say, it wasn't there anymore. It was on the way to becoming the, the corn cob. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, and by, you know, some of these places, by the time, I mean, like the late 70s or, or 80s, a place like the Coliseum, was really run down. I don't know if anybody remembers it that from that time, and it was kind of a second run house, or if it was first run, it was they were pretty bad movies, and it was you didn't want to look too closely at the floors or the corners. <laughs> it was not. Uh, it had it had really try not to disturb that rat who was eating your shoe. No, I'm I'm sure he was enjoying the movie too. Um, yeah, John. My, or played Sound of Music for two years in the 60s. And Dr. Zhivago and Rosemary's Baby and Mary mm -hmm. Poppins all played all at, I think, the Music Box and the Blue Mouse, which aren't there anymore. Yeah, the, um, yeah. Those, are, those are road shows, as they used to call them, the reserve seat attractions and films which have been de designated events and are treated like sort of like uh, honorary theatrical stage presentations, except they happen to be movies. Uh, but but that that phenomenon in itself came to an end. Uh, I remember that uh, in the, well uh, in the late 1960s, Billy Wilder set out to make a roadshow attraction, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, and uh, by the time it came to the screen, a number of films thus designated had had died horrible deaths, like Star, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
and and uh, in the end, the, the the studio United Artists didn't even release the movie at the roadshow length intended, but they cut it down by 45 minutes or something and just released it as a regular movie. And even there, it uh, it, it it died because at that moment in in the evolution of the cinema and audiences' taste, everybody wanted it. It was the era of the cinemobile movies made out there in reality like Easy Rider and Midnight Cowboy and who wanted to see some elaborate art directed masterpiece mm -hmm. like The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes and uh, I uh, I know the, the 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 weekend that opened during Christmas time 1970 I saw it on a weekend night uh, at I think that was the Blue Mouse that was playing it uh, across the street from the music box, and uh, I believe there were a total of eight of us in mm. that cavernous theater. Mm -hmm. We saw a great film, but um, yeah, um, an era had uh, had ended. Yes. Um, hey. I, I just wanted to uh, put in a plug for um, there's the old Cook Chai Theater in the International District. Um, I don't know what year it started. I know it's in from the 60s because my earliest film viewing experiences were in the um, um, 70s. And uh, like Monday nights, my parents would, would go and see a double feature of Chinese films. It was my first exposure to all of Disney films that he made in Hong Kong and um, elsewhere in Asia. Um, I don't remember the order of what nights, but like one of the other nights, like Tuesdays were like either Korean films, Japanese films, and then Wednesday was the other films. So every night of the weeknight, they had different Asian films, double features every night. And it, and my, we went there for several years until that theater finally closed down. It was wonderful that such a thing could exist, and it was in effect an alternative reality that people scanning the movie listings uh, didn't even know it existed. And I know Peter Hoke and I made a pilgrimage down there to see Kurosawa's Red Beard uh, a couple of years before it was available with distribution to art theaters. Mm. But meanwhile, uh, Toho was booking it directly uh, in, into the, the Kokusai. Mm. And, uh, yeah, in, in fact, when... Uh, when Ozu kind of broke as a, as a, a phenomenon uh, in New York, uh, in the um, I'm trying to remember the the year it was anyway it was the year that they released an autumn afternoon and and late autumn and a couple of other movies and were writing about them with great excitement in the Village Voice and saying these are the first showings of this movie these films in this country I said well actually we had shown them at the Edgemont. Mm -hmm. uh, three years earlier, but we had booked them directly from um, Shochiku, uh, but but they weren't officially in U.S. distribution mm. as as art films. Therefore, they didn't exist as far as people in the Village Voice. Were Not concerned. to the Village Voice, yeah. No. Uh, yeah, we we have a little something on on that theater up in Celluloid, Seattle. They they uh, some someone had kept a couple of posters from that that are really charming and. Uh, there's a, there's a vintage quote from a, a newspaper account of the, how special it was to go to that theater and kind of go into this unusual uh, sort of enclave. But, yeah, that's a really uh, that's a, an interesting part of movie going is um, uh, the s small theaters that could survive, you know, over the, over the course of uh, years or sometimes decades like that. And, yes? Central District's now home to Central Cinema, but I'm curious if there are any other theaters that occupy the Central District area or Madrona or Madison Valley before its opening, and if so, what kind of films they showed? I'm afraid I don't know that territory at all. Um, there, there are a few that, that turned up uh, when we were doing research for uh, Celluloid Seattle, but they're hard, it's hard to find a record of them, actually. And um, I think partly that's because they've been gone for a long time. And I suspect partly because uh, if, if what it's, you know, it sounds like there were maybe a couple of uh, theaters that catered uh, mostly to African-American audiences. And I suspect that the, the newspapers were not uh, talking about them. Because I looked, I looked in the, the Seattle Times, going way, way back. Uh, for I would even search on the the, uh, the names of the theaters, 
uh, and they have a really good search engine set up, but it was very rare to find a, a reference to that. So we did not find too much on that uh, particular uh, piece of community history, I'm afraid. Last question. Okay. Bye. Oh, and really, I was going to ask two questions. Well, we got time. <laughs> The first one is, I'm a suburban boy from around here, so I can remember going to the Lewis and Clark Theater with 2,500 seats in it as, you know, a big theater kind yeah. of event. Could you talk a little bit about sort of the suburban rise in the Seattle area? And the other question is, I started with SIF in its first year, and I can't think of a single phenomenon in our city, whether it's a a theater or an, an organization running a theater that's made so much impact. And so I guess I'd like to hear a little more about that. Lewis and Clark was part of uh, a circuit of uh, three big uh, theaters. Uh, Northgate and John Dance were the other two. John Dance over in uh, Bellevue. And I think speaking of flagships, I think that was the flagship theater of the Sterling organization. Uh, and yeah, they they were big big houses, and they were usually showing the same first run attraction, different, very different points around the compass in uh, uh, in in Seattle. And uh, they were they were definitely very very active. I I spent a lot of happy nights, uh, in my cases at the, at the Northgate. Mm -hmm. uh, later, I think the South Center kind of became the the official South End um, member of that, and L Lewis and Clark dwindled a bit. Began to decline, yeah, uh, before then they, then they also chopped that one up to create more screens, um, although they still had a huge, still had a huge theater down there. But yeah, that was the phenomenon, that was part of the lifespan of, of a city and movie theaters, is that suburban phenomenon where you just think, well, of course you can put a 2,000 seat theater and it will, it will always be uh, economically viable. And it just turned out that for a while it was, and then at a certain point um, it wasn't. And I, I said first run, and they did do first runs, but I'm realizing that it often was the case that they were, they were showing almost first run, uh, something had opened downtown officially for its first week or so. But then, uh, you know, people weren't that crazy about necessarily going downtown to see a movie, so they would move them out to these big houses in the suburbs, and then they would really take off if the yeah. film was any kind, had any kind of legs. I always uh, felt like maybe because the Northgate was a, a, a popular place of my childhood that uh, these, these suburban and, and sometimes mall-associated giant theaters uh, were part of the, well, I, I mean, it, they, they were a place to drop off kids, and they probably still are, I assume, uh, except there's 12 theaters now instead of one giant one. But you just got dropped off, you went into the theater, movie was halfway over, looks like Ali McGraw is already sick, okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, they just stay through the end of it and watch it again, you know, and so on. Uh, so I... I I know that the phenomenon of people just walking in on, in the middle of movies predated the, the mall era, but it was kind of uniquely uh, suited to that when you're talking about parents dropping off their kids. And I have many, many Northgate movies that I saw, I think, where... where uh, and it was interesting, because then you got to see part of the movie twice, you know, and that was sort of an interesting phenomenon. Uh, uh, not that you want no, to see... I, just, I had that happen a lot long before we had multiplexes yes. and so forth. It, we would we would go in uh, yeah the classic line this is where we came in well mm -hmm. the this is where we came in was only a point of technical interest with us because we were damn well going to sit there and watch it all mm -hmm. uh, the, the the whole way through but mm -hmm. but it really was uh, uh, the beginnings of training I think of critical awareness in, in my case because you began to see how films fit together and you knew how you felt watching that scene without really the preparation for what came before. But then when you saw it coming around again in the context of the whole movie, mm -hmm. you began to see how the pieces fit, and oh, if they had done this this way instead of that way, it would have been very different. So it was a useful useful exercise. But yeah, at some point it just became unthinkable that you would walk into the movie yeah, at any true. old point. <laughs> I don't remember what, what brought about that change, but it's like, what am I doing? <laughs> Never again. 
Well, and we know how Woody Allen felt about it in Annie Hall. It was <laughs> practically a, a relationship killer. 